Hello everyone, it's Aisha White and I am here today with Kevin D. Lyles. Um, he is a commercial and a documentary photographer based in Atlanta. Uh, Kevin, do you want to say hello to everyone? Hello, thanks for having me today. Yeah, thank you so much for agreeing to chat. I'm really excited to just kind of pick your brain about uh, photography and the ways that it connects with communication. Um, awesome. So yeah, so first of all, I think it's important to get some background um, on you as an individual and your photography. So when mm -hmm. did you realize you wanted to be a photographer and what did the process of getting started look like for you? Yeah, so well, thank you again for having me. I'm really excited to do this um, and uh, looking, looking forward to seeing it. Uh, yeah, so photography started for me when I was a reporter for a small newspaper down in South Georgia. I had gone to school at Valdosta State for a couple of years. This is, you know, I was, you know, I was like 21 and I quit college. I really didn't know what I was doing uh, with my life. And I got a job as a reporter on a whim. Mm -hmm. uh, I was interested in journalism. And so I got this job and I had to take a lot of my own pictures. That was part of the job as small staff. We had a staff photographer. Mm -hmm. But because of the number of assignments, it was a daily newspaper. Well, six days a week, didn't publish on Monday. But with the number of assignments, we had to shoot up a lot of, a lot of our own stuff. They handed me a Canon AE-1 film camera yeah, uh, with the 50 millimeter lens. And we got the negatives uh, uh, developed at Walmart. Mm -hmm. And I brought them back to the office, the newsroom, and I scanned them in and we, you know, finished them up with Photoshop. But at any rate, that's where I fell in love with photography is, is having to shoot uh, stuff for my own stories. And I had a friend of mine who I went to college with at Valdosta State who was a photojournalist at a nearby newspaper in Tifton. And so I started picking his brain and started asking him a lot of questions and hanging out with him. And, and I was realizing that I could, this is something I could pursue as a career. And so I just made that my goal. Nice. So very much so you think that the hands-on experience of actually working within journalism, it, um, it was effective to really get like a hands-on experience and kind of be thrown into the water, I guess, and learn to swim? For me, it definitely was. Uh, I, think for a, I think for a lot of people with learning photography in an academic setting, it can be daunting and intimidating. Mm -hmm you know, to learn from the masters and see all this great work and be inundated with how things are done um, at that level. Mm -hmm. And to try to go and produce that kind of work can be very, very intimidating. And so for me, I didn't have any of that. Like, it was just like, here, take pictures. Mm -hmm. And so it was, yeah, thrown into the fire. I mean, just, just go do it. And it, the beauty of it is that, and I, like I said, I didn't have any formal training in it. So I didn't care what mistakes I made. Yeah. Like, you know, I it did. I wasn't trying to impress anybody except trying to get better for myself, if that makes sense. So, yeah. uh, I for me, it was it was a great experience, and and I think that I try to well, I try to encourage that with people who are learning photography is is not to try to put too much pressure on yourself and trying to make great images or or knock it out of the park. At, you know, at the very beginning, like, you know, make a lot of mistakes, make a lot of mistakes. You know, it takes years of mistakes to get really good at anything. Yeah. And that's, you know, I think that uh, working in a small newspaper allows you to make a lot of mistakes mm -hmm. and, and it be okay, you know, and learn from them. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I think that's really useful information for people. Like I'm slowly like transitioning into photography. I've been attending your yeah. photo night events and um, I actually shot a wedding uh, not long ago. Oh, so, cool. Yeah, and it was it was an exciting experience, but it was a production, you know, <laughs> like everything yeah. to it. And um, yeah, so I think that's a lot of helpful, helpful information for somebody that's out there where you're trying to find your footing and I think, figure out, am I good or not? Like at what, you know, at what I do. So. Yeah. And I, I shot, I've shot a ton of weddings and weddings are stressful. Yeah. Uh, they are hard to, yeah. to get those things right. But the, the weddings are a lot of fun too. I used to, I used to love shooting weddings. The thrill of like how much pressure's on it, you know, it's that one day you got to get it, you know? Yeah. So that's exactly. great. And it was an unplugged wedding. So it was like, you are the loan. <laughs> <laughs> no backup, no yeah. plan B, right? Yeah. That was great. <laughs> so um, presently you are the team photographer for the Atlanta Braves and mm -hmm. some of your work also, which 
stunning photos, by the way. Um, oh, I'll, thank you. I appreciate yeah, that. I'll provide a link to your Instagram and people can go and, you know, gaze at your photos that you take from the games. Um, well, thank you. You're welcome. And I know your work has um, made it to Sports Illustrated with um, other with football and just other sports um, photography that you've taken. But I know that you also have projects outside of the sports realm. So if you could just elaborate on some of your creative endeavors outside of just sports. Yeah, so, you know, the, the Braves thing is fairly new for me. So last season, 2019, that was my first full season with the Braves. So 2018, I came on halfway through the season. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm still a freelancer. I'm still a contract photographer. So that's not, that takes up a lot of my time, but it's not all I do. So I also work for, like you said, Sports Illustrated, uh, publications like the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, stuff like that, Washington Post. Um, and my background, a lot of my background is in news. So I, I, I've done and still do a, a decent amount of news and political coverage. I haven't done quite so much um, this past year uh, because of Braves. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, th these are a lot of things I've done. Um, I also have some, some personal work that I've done. I had a project published and of course this is a few years ago, it was 2015, but it was kind of, I've been shooting that for most of my life. Uh, it was a, a love letter to highway 83, which is a state highway that courses through a little hometown I grew up in and, uh, wherever I live for most of my know 20s and some of my 30s I would end up driving this certain route mm -hmm. and so I would taken pictures along the way and I just wrote an essay about what that road meant to me um, and it's so funny I went to I was, it was 2015 I had moved to Atlanta I was trying to get more work and I was pitching ideas to editors any you know anyone I could and mm -hmm. so I had a meeting at the AJC and I was meeting with their uh, director of photography and a couple of people and I had like five or six ideas for essays that I was, you know, wanted to, photo essays I wanted to do or projects. And I had gone down the list of all the ones that I thought that they might be interested in. And I said, now here's this kind of crazy one. It's a, it's a love letter to a road. You know, in my mind, I'm like, who wants to publish that? This is a long shot. That's why I saved it to the end actually. Yeah. And they were like, oh, oh, tell us more. And I was like, okay, all right, all right. So it's about a road and what it means to me. and you know, it, almost like a country song, you know, yeah, like what yeah. this road, you know, what it's meant to me over the years, um, you know, driving back and forth from college and different places. And what I think about when I'm driving is beautiful. It's a beautiful stretch of road. And they were like, oh my God, yes, we, we have a thing called personal journeys. We'd love for this to be a part of it. I was like, okay, wow. And so I went and shot some more for this project. And of course I had, like I said, I had taken pictures on my own for no other purpose than just wanting to take pictures. Right. And I put some of those together and then went and shot some more and they published it in like they had it was the front of the um, life section and it had like two full pages inside of photographs. Wow. Yeah. On a Sunday. Right. And so, yeah, as you know, Sunday newspapers are the, you know, the, the big ones. And so, yeah. yeah, so that was really cool. You know, that was a project that meant a lot to me um, because of, you know, just being such a personal project um, that was that was, uh, that was really cool. Um, you know, I'm working on, this is related, but I'm working on another essay myself, right? I haven't published, really published anything with this, but the little town I grew up in is called Bostwick, Georgia. Okay. And it's about 600 people. It's tiny. Wow. Um, we're known for our, we have a cotton gin festival every November because it's the only operating cotton gin north of Macon, I believe. Oh. Uh, it's one of the very few at any rate. <laughs> so anyway, just growing up in this small town, um, you know, what it's like, um, and, and I, I, you know, what life is like in Boston. So I've shot some stuff on that. That'll hopefully, you know, kind of form together. Um, and then the last thing I'll talk more about this in a minute, but this is, you know, another personal project I'm working on is, um, being a freelancer now I miss newsrooms. Mm -hmm. So like working in a newsroom was, um, a wonderful experience for me. I mean, you had a lot of creative people, uh, basically putting together a small book every day. Yeah. Right. And it was just a wonderful experience for me with, you know, you know, creative ideas bouncing off each other. Um, and it was high stress in a lot of situations, not all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know, I just really enjoyed that. And I want to kind of capture what that is like. 
a bit, but also show what newsrooms have been, you know, they've been decimated over the years from, from the Great Recession. You know, they really haven't recovered so well. I mean, so big newspapers have, I think. The New York Times is making more money than ever on subscriptions. Yeah. But, you know, smaller newspapers are, are really struggling, and, and, and I kind of want to show a little bit of that. So there's a little bit of some of the personal work I've done, and a lot of the other stuff for, you know, the publications I work for are, are all assignment-based, but it, it, you know, m most of it these days centers around sports, but there's a lot of, you know, some other stuff too with um, some politics and just issues. Um, like I traveled to Alabama, uh, to Birmingham a few weeks ago for the Wall Street Journal about a story about their, they have um, too many uh, of those self-storage places. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's like, it's, uh, you know, so the people who live there just like there's say there's way too many of them and 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 uh they're trying to figure out how to like enact policy to kind of tamp that down a little bit so yeah. just you know who would ever think about that right it's just really <laughs> in interesting stuff that you you know i would never think about but they call and ask me to go illustrate it so yeah and bring it to life that, that story so yeah 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 exactly which was basically a portrait of a city council person who's trying to you know make change in this and then photograph some of the storage facility places, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, that, you know, that's a small example. Do you have a particular preference when it comes to the focus? I know if it's an assignment, it's an assignment. So you only have so much control over, but. Oh, sure. Uh, you know, I love things that deal with religion okay. and uh, especially here in the South, mm -hmm. you know, when, when you have like, you know, especially when you have like politics and religion and stuff yeah. where they kind of intersect. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of a story that was one of my favorites I've worked on. Okay. So, and I've done a lot of work with politics over the past four or five years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, starting with 20, really ramped up in 2016 when Trump was elected. All the coverage about that, especially here in the South. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the publications, you know, the stories were centered on understanding the Trump voter. Right. That was a, a big emphasis on a lot of the work I did. And being here in Georgia, there was a lot of that kind of work being done. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in Alabama, this was after, do you remember when uh, Roy Moore was running for Senate? No, was it Senate? Was it a Senate seat? Yeah, because Jeff Sessions uh -huh. became uh, Attorney General, and so he had an open seat. So Roy Moore, do you remember that? That name is really familiar. Yeah, so Roy Moore was a really controversial figure. He had a lot of really controversial ideas, very conservative. Right. And uh, basically, his election turned into um, almost like it was the same dynamics as the 2016 election, right? Okay. And it was in a microcosm. It was just in Alabama, but it had the exact same feel as the Trump election, mm -hmm. right? So it was very contested. It was, it was very... Uh, charged emotionally. Um, it was just, you know, tensions were really high with, for this election. And so the New York Times called me for this story and what they wanted to, to talk about was football, right? Mm -hmm. And how no matter what is going on in the state of Alabama, no matter how bad things can be, right? Whether it be, uh, you know, politics or the fact that, let's say, you know, that they did so poorly with their, uh, you know, where they rank in the country as far as um, their schools or whatever is happening in Alabama, they've got football. And that was what they're really, you know, they can put all differences aside and like rally for their team. And so <laughs> I went to a, an Auburn game and photographed that game from that perspective. Uh -huh. And that was really, really cool to me to do that, to show, because to me, you know, here in the South, because uh, football is different here in the South than it is the rest of the country, I do believe. Oh, and yeah. it's because of a lot of these, uh, so much happening here, um, you know, with with so many different issues. I don't know, it just, to be able to focus on that at a football game was, mm -hmm. was really cool to me. Yeah. Uh, instead of just covering a football game, you know what right. I mean? Um, do you find that that's the case? Is like you're always finding new spins on something to just, present it in a way that maybe hasn't been presented in a way before. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the goal. Like, yeah. you know, you want to, you want to try to do something a little different that's fun and interesting and not cliche. And, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that's a hard, that's a hard thing to do. Like I, uh, I went, I photographed two, do you know, have you heard of the college park Skyhawks? It's the new like minor league team for the Hawks. So oh, it's their first season. Uh -huh. um, it's called the NBA G league. It used to be the D league. Now it's the G league, but it's, it's their minor league. Right. And so uh, 
I've shot two games in the past, I guess like two weeks. And I went and shot the first game and I noticed from where I sit on the floor, the background was really uh, clean. And what I mean by that is most arenas have signs and LED boards mm -hmm. and blinky things. And just, it's just really cluttered backgrounds. Like, uh, you know, if you go to a baseball game, look at the, look at the wall, mm -hmm. right? If there's ads on every, you know, it seems yeah. like every 30 feet, there's a huge ad. And so as a photographer, that's your background. Yeah. And that's like very cluttered and busy. And, uh, you know, you just want to clean it up with a nice clean background. Well, this arena has a black wall. So it looked like it was almost shot in a studio if you shot tight enough. Right. So the second game I shot, I, uh, I shot it with a 400 millimeter lens. Most of the game, which is like really long lens when I shoot for like football and other things and just really trying to clean up that background. And so I'm telling you all this because I, I just posted a, a gallery for, or, you know, on, on Instagram, uh, a selection of images that I turned black and white. It just, I had this really stark black background with uh, a really tight players of basketball. It was a little bit different. Yeah. So I've never done that before and I've never been in a place that had such a clean background. Mm -hmm. So it was, that's an example to answer your question of trying to do a little bit different and not just be, here's some pictures from the game. Yeah. And you felt like, Oh, thank you. <laughs> you saw that clean background. Like, yes. I can't with this. Was your mind yes. kind of like going and you were putting together what you could do with it? Yes. Yeah. So like I, I saw the images when I got home from the, or I saw it when I was there, but then I looked at the images and I was like, okay, this is really cool. What can I do with this? Yeah. And so I was like, I just want to get that, you know, in photography, you know, the tighter you can get it, a lot of times it cleans up the background because there's nothing, you know, you can really distill it down. So it's just difficult to shoot at a 400 millimeter because it's so tight. You know, they, if, you know, every time they move, you've got to follow it, you know? So it, it, it was a little bit of a challenge, but it was fun. It made, that's what makes or keeps it interesting. You know what I mean? Like yeah. if you just go and shoot a game and it, you know, especially baseball is 81 games every year. Yeah. 81 home games. That is, they play 162, which is bonkers. I only cover the home games. Okay. Uh, so yeah, trying to keep that interesting is a, is a constant challenge. Yeah. You know, these are the I, little ways. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, yeah. sorry. These are the little ways I do that is trying to find little fun things to, to, to photograph and capture. Yeah. Cause I'm always curious. I, I do. I'm like, does it ever get old when it's, you know, on the field and you're, you know, the same players and, you know, rotate. Yeah. 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 I mean, it does. I mean, it, you know, be kidding yourself if you didn't say that. I mean, it, it does. It's very repetitive and monotonous and you just try to find, something interesting um and i've got a you know a plan next year because braves come in homestand so they have like eight to ten games seven to ten somewhere in that ballpark uh on the road uh, home and then on the road for the same amount so it's yeah. like a, a lot of games you know together and then they're on the road so for each homestand i'm going to try to focus on one thing okay. right i mean cover the game like normal but inside of that try to have a theme or something yeah. You know, and have a challenge or something to focus on, you know? Yeah, that touches on another question I had for you about themes. I know you're mentioning a theme for specifically for uh, the Braves shoots that you're doing, but um, also I know you mentioned religion being a theme also. Um, sure. So that was the question is, you know, is there a theme that you insert intentionally or do you take photos and maybe over time, over the span of your career that you looked at things and saw that things reoccurred and you recognize like, oh wow, there's a, a theme that I've stuck to over this time. Yeah, I, and I wanna stop and say that like, I know I told you this, but seriously, these are the best questions. I've, I've been, been interviewed a handful of times. It's not like I'm some like, you know, professional person being interviewed, but uh, <laughs> are. these are, these are uh, the best questions I've ever seen. These Thank are amazing. Thank you so much. That made me feel like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to think hard about these. Most questions, you know, were like, hey, how did you get started? And what do you like? And what camera do you use? Stuff like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, but this is, uh, yeah, these, these, I had to think about these, which is really cool. I appreciate that. Um, so with themes, you know, again, like religion probably um, is uh, probably the biggest one, you know, um, that I'm just kind of drawn to. Um, I'm drawn to how, I'm just fascinated with people in religion. I grew up in a Southern Baptist home and, and, and community uh, or, you know, with a, a small Baptist church where I grew up. And, uh, and I, I don't know, like, I'm just really fascinated with how, how that plays out in people's lives, you know, um, especially in places like sporting environments or, or, or different places where, 
before that happens. Um, you know, like I was, I covered, this is a very sad story, is when I covered the uh, the shootings in Charleston. Yeah. Do you remember that in 2015? Yeah. Yep, yep, yeah. 2015. Yeah. And of course, religion was a, a very large part of it because that happened in a church, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but how how people came together, you know, how that kind of coalesced people and, and um, churches from different denominations across the city, across the country, but like came together and really um, helped one another, uh, you know, but, but definitely, I mean, I would say religion, but there, there's, there are other themes that I'm interested in as well. Um, anything that has to do with like curiosity and just the wonder of the world, you know, I know that's, that's a very large theme, but, um, like I have this picture of, um, from the, uh, um, eclipse, the, to the total eclipse, like, mm -hmm. was that 2017? I can't believe how much time has passed already, but, uh, yeah. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so my then girlfriend, my wife, now we went, went up there to, uh, to, Unicoi State Park in Helen, which is where they, it was a, that was in the path of totality. So it was going to be completely blocked out. Yeah. And I have this picture of this, this kid and we went, we were basically in the, in the beach area of like the lake there. And there was kind of maybe 50, hundred people out there kind of watching the same thing or waiting on it to happen. And I have a picture of these, these kids standing there in the water and they're just like looking up, like completely in awe of mm -hmm. like what's happening, you know? And to me, that was a much more important picture than the eclipse itself, right? Was right. how, because I mean, the picture of the eclipse is cool, but everybody's yeah. going to have that picture, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> there's going to be a million of those pictures. And so yeah. photographing those kids, uh, to me, that captured it. You know, to me, that captured it more than the, than the moon and sun itself. And so that just sense of kind of wonder yeah. and curiosity I, and there's a, a, what's going on around you, you know? Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> Um, so how do you approach um, photographing um, subjects that are in the midst of emotional, emotionally driven um, moments? So whether it's sports and there's a huge win or if you're there for a Braves game and it's, you know, a loss or something like that. How do you mm -hmm. how do you capture that and not feel like um, and maybe it's a little bit more intense when it's like a, a portrait that you're taking? Um, mm -hmm. How do you approach that without feeling like you're, I guess, intruding? If it's something like with the the church shooting and sure, it's sure, a delicate topic. Yeah, and there's really no there's no one answer. You know, you just try to be as sensitive as possible, uh, and you try to, or I try to, um, you know, not be in their face. You you become really aware of body language. Yeah, like that that becomes you know, the psychology of photography is so, it, it's so much a part of it, you know, and what I mean by that is the psychology of like understanding people and like your presence and how your presence is changing, how they're behaving and, you know, that little dance, yeah. uh, because taking pictures is only, you know, 15% of this whole thing, really. I mean, the rest of it is what is so hard. I mean, the pictures are hard enough, but like this kind of stuff you're talking about is what's challenging. Um, and so, you know, I try to let, people know that I'm there for a, if I can have a conversation with them, if I can tell them what I'm doing and, and let them know that I'm not there to show them in a bad light. Right. You know, if, if there's a chance for an interaction, if I can talk to them, that's what I try to do. If I can't, you know, it depends. Sometimes you, sometimes it means you don't take the picture. Right. You know, uh, there's plenty of times and I can't think of a specific example right now, but I, there's plenty of times where, you know, you just don't take the picture. Yeah. Um, you're right there and somebody starts crying or uh, it, you know, I'll tell you a time it did happen is I photographed a woman in just down in Savannah for the New York times, a woman whose son was killed uh, and by the police uh, right outside, like out the front door. Like they came to arrest him and obviously things went South and you know, young, young man, you know, teenager or maybe early twenties, but anyway uh, was killed right there in front of her basically. So we're there to tell that story. And that's extremely sensitive. Like you can't get more sensitive. Basically right. we're in her house. She pictures of her son everywhere. She's talking about him and she starts crying. And, you know, I'm like seven feet from her. And it was one of those times where I felt like, Oh gosh, put the camera down. 
talk to her, you know, whatever. But then it's like inside, I'm like, no, she knows I'm here to tell this story. She, I'm in her home and I'm here for the New York Times. She wants this story to be told. And part of this story is that pain, yeah. right? And so I shot through it. I didn't say a word. I just kept taking pictures. Not a lot, you know, uh, now it's crazy. I have these silent cameras, these Sony mirrorless that you can't even hear them. But the, this was not a silent camera. You could hear every time I took a picture, but I took, I was very judicious in, you know, taking those, you know, I took a, you know, a few, but um, I just shot through that and, um, and shot and photographed her crying. And uh, so there's an example of when, you know, I felt the need to do that. And there's other times where you just don't, um, you know, like a, a Braves loss, for example, of course, as the team photographer, I'm not really going to photograph a lot of that, um, anguish of a loss. I mean, I'll get some of that, but you know, they're just not going to use a whole lot of those right. kinds yeah. of pictures. But if I were on assignment for, you know, sports illustrated covering the game and there's fans who are dejected, um, a lot of times I'm far enough away where it doesn't matter. You know, I can kind of like use a long lens and, and, but if I'm close enough, I'll get a few pictures and keep moving. Mm -hmm. You know, I won't, you know, kind of, it's all about respect. And uh, for me, not trying to invade, you know, and if, if, the, if they see me and they say, Hey, what are you doing? I'll tell them, you know, Hey, look, man, I'm, you know, I'm a photographer with sports illustrated. I'm here trying to capture this. Mm -hmm. If they are really upset about it, which doesn't, that doesn't happen very often. I'll, you know, fine. I won't use it. I'll delete it. No problem. You know, yeah. maybe not delete it, but I, I, I won't use it. I won't send it in. You know? Right. Do you think people are kind of magnets for cameras? It's funny because I, I see like a mm. situation like I, I if I have a camera, either people are like no and shining it away, or like hey, mm. I'm ready, I'm ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know what ends up happening a lot of times is when I'm trying to capture a moment um, in in an environment, people when they see the camera, most of the time they let's say I'm trying to frame a picture and I'm just, you know, waiting for people to move around or walk through the frame or, you know, I'm in a public setting, for example. Um, as soon as people see the camera, a lot of times they, they pose, Hey, smile, you know, or they, they'll tell the kid, or if I'm trying to get a moment, there's a kid doing something. Uh -huh. They'll tell the kid, Hey, smile for the camera. And as soon as they do that, the, the it's ruined. Yeah. You know? And yeah. so that's what I've noticed. And you really can't do anything about it. You know, yeah. you can't, I mean, you can't say no at that point, they're conscious of you and it just, you know, all is lost. So you try to be as inconspicuous as possible, which I'm not trying to plug these cameras, but these new silent cameras make this, it's just a game changer. It's, it's, and I'm not one to like geek out on gear too much, but like, it's, it's totally a different world now where you can, but I can come up right behind you. Not that I'm sneaky, but you know, <laughs> That does sound sneaky, but you know, yeah, like but, when you're trying to get a picture without ruining the moment, you know what yeah, I mean? Definitely. Um, and so when you can do that, what's that? I, I was just agreeing with you, like in moments where you kind of have to be invisible, then that helps a lot to be silent. Yeah. Cause photojournalists, man, we've been dreaming about this for since the beginning of photojournalism. It's like, you know, imagine being silent and yeah. it's like, Oh sure. That's a pipe dream. And like, no, now it's real. That's really cool. I remember yeah. um, sitting in on one of those ATL photo night events and I can't remember the photographer's name, but he worked on set with a lot of films and he was just kind of testifying to the usefulness of a mirrorless camera and how it's quiet because that's what you need is quiet on set, you know? Yeah, so, uh, yeah Quantrell Colbert, that guy, the uh, yeah, film guy. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's transformed photography because mirrorless cameras have, have been around for a while. Uh, they just haven't been um, at the pro level. Yeah. You know, and then Sony made these things and they, they are. And so it's, yeah, it was, it, it was not a joke before, but it was something that wasn't really feasible, you know, okay. just like, you know, it's like, well, that's fine and dandy, but it's not good for a professional, but now they are. And so yeah. it's, it's totally changed everything. That's really cool. I have to take a deeper look at it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's incredible. Um, what's wild is the autofocus on these things is so much faster because it focuses directly on the sensor. Uh -huh. And I don't, don't ask me any more questions about that. I don't know like <laughs> the specifics or physics of that, uh -huh. but I know that the, the, the way it's inherent in that technology that the autofocus is faster than a DSLR. So it's like laser sharp back fast. 
that's really neat yeah yeah so I, I know i'm like gushing about these things no but. it's i mean like that's your world man so yeah like, <laughs> yeah it focuses on um it, it, it'll track your eye oh it tracks yeah. it tracks your eye so like if i'm taking a portrait of you uh-huh and i'm holding it down it just follows your eye wherever you go oh wow yeah yeah, yeah, I'm definitely gonna be like <laughs> after this interview. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, what the topic you were just talking about, um, but, you know, being invisible, being silent with the mirrorless cameras kind of hand mm -hmm. um, lends itself to the next question about um, interactions with people. So, uh, how do you do you have pointers for avoiding awkward interactions with subjects? So what I try to do is find common ground as fast as possible. Yeah. So this has come naturally to me because I just like talking to people. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's what I do when I'm at the grocery store. Right. Yeah. So this has, uh, I didn't realize that was a skill being a talker. Mm -hmm. Right. It is. That it was <laughs> that it was valuable in the workplace. You know what I mean? Because I, I'm telling you when I was in school, I got in trouble. 90% of my trouble was talking <laughs> in class, right? Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't, I just wanted to talk. I was like, hey, you know, I just wanted to joke around and have fun. And yeah. that's, I was always in trouble for talking. It's crazy. So that's what I would do is, is find common ground. Yeah. You know, whatever that is, where are you from? You know, like where, I know that's a, a, a low hanging fruit, but whatever the situation is, I just try to talk to them and, let them know that I'm, um, that I'm human too. And that, you know, we're, we're in this thing together and, you know, does that make sense? That's yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, because I'm a, an introverted nature and like the whole mm -hmm. point of this channel is about improving my communication. I was a communication major, but I'm just still trying sure. to improve my communication and kind of putting myself in these situations where I'm talking to different people, different personalities and different backgrounds. And, uh, mm -hmm. that idea that like a more, introverted person or someone that that it doesn't necessarily naturally flow out of me or you know not just me but other people who may be watching that are interested in photography also and it's like how do you feel those awkward gaps of you know silence and things yeah. like that? how do you make someone feel comfortable in front of the camera so no I think that that makes a lot of sense um it just yeah and that's that's hard getting somebody comfortable in front of the camera that's yeah. something I still struggle with or I mean you, you never perfect it. Right? right. So I shouldn't say something I struggle with, but something that I'm always working on. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. With like, like with portraits, I'll, I'll tell you an example that blew my mind. It was a big like learning moment for me. Gregory Heisler is a, is a look him up amazing, amazing portrait photographer. Okay. Uh, it's got many time magazine covers and, you know, worked a lot for sports illustrated just over, I think most of his work was like eighties, nineties, I think, okay. but he's still shooting. I think he, um, he teaches now for the Hallmark Institute, which teaches photography. Um, anyway, uh, he came and spoke at the Atlanta photojournalism seminar several years ago. And he was talking about photographing some CEO, right? Or maybe it was the mayor of New York at the time. I can't remember, but the guy was really hard and like, you know, okay, let's get this over with kind of, kind of stuff. And, you still got to shoot through that. You still got to make a good picture when you're shooting for time magazine, right? You can't just be like, well, he was stuffy. So I got a bad picture. It's like, no, you, that's your job. Yeah. So they were working with this guy and, uh, and he just kept, you know, they would, the more they worked with him, he just was the same, you know? And so his assistant asked him, Hey, what's your favorite candy bar? And he went, huh? And he looked up and that when he looked up, okay. like that was the picture. Nice. Because he had let go of all of that and was thinking about something that's good to him, a candy yeah. bar. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, yeah. that's how he got a picture, <laughs> you know? Because like, you know, when you take portraits, you're like, okay, now look over here and have this feeling, you know, but right. like you can't really manufacture that in a lot of ways. So I was just blown away at how, how he approaches subjects. So that's, that's an example of, 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 um, of really pushing through and trying to get someone to behave in a way you would like them to in front of the camera. Right. They become disarmed and like just a little tiny moment of vulnerability where you're like, yep. oh, think about it. It's like, yeah. Yep. Yep. That's really, that really smart. Cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's so simple, but it just makes a lot of sense. It does, right? Like, what's your favorite candy bar? It just took him off guard. It's like, oh, wow. Okay. And, uh, 
Yeah, it's it's unbelievable how like like that's the psychology I'm talking about about mm-hmm. photography. You know how oh, that's really to me that's 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 the hard part. <clears throat> yeah, I, I appreciate that it's not no pun intended not just black and white, but like there's different layers to photography. It's more than just you know behind the lens or in front of the lens. But yeah, the thought process of how you want to approach somebody, whether or not you shoot in the moment or you hold back, um, you know, sure. types of topics you, you, you know, cover. So it's really, really cool. Just the diversity in it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So when you're um, in the midst of these different environments, you may come mm-hmm. in contact with someone that holds a different viewpoint than you do. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering how you how you approach it so that it's unbiased. Your attitude um, is unbiased, and whatever your view is does not come across in your photo. And so you're able to present it and tell a story without I don't know like <laughs> putting them in deep shadows and making them look menacing. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, that's a good question, and that's something that I've thought a lot about. And um, you know, especially as polarized as our country's become, especially right. since 2016, right? Um, these are these are issues that, that come up a lot in this in this work. It's it's folks who are on the other side of whatever issue or or, or think completely different than me. Yeah. And ninety nine percent of them want the same things that I want. Right. Right. They just have a different way of looking at it. Mm-hmm. And that's a really hard thing to. It was for me to like get to. Right. Because you're like, well, if you think this, then that means you're this. And like, right. I hate you. Like that's easy to go that route. Yeah. And I'm going to go back to this Roy Moore example. Mm-hmm. All right. So when this this uh, election was happening, people were up in arms that people would that they would people would support him. Like a lot of folks on the left were like really just outraged that that he had so much support and he was on the ver- he lost that Senate race, but he was that was on the verge of winning it. Yeah. And so I talked to a lot of people and they were just like you know I couldn't believe like he he when he was a judge he was really controversial because he put up the 10 commandments in the courtroom or on the courthouse or right outside the courthouse. So stuff like that was, was, yeah. was what he did. And people were really upset about his way. Right. right. So I thought about it and I was like, you know what, the people who support him are like people I grew up with, uh, back home. Right. And, and my, a lot of my family and people who are, have the same values that most people in the country have. They want a good community, they care about their families, you know, they're good husbands and fathers and wives and sons and daughters. It's not like folks who are, you know, like it's not like Roy Moore supporters are just like Trump supporters are not like not good people. Right. And it's so easy for folks to have those types of attitudes, whether it's the right or the left, you know? And so I went into that, that story, I pitched an idea to, uh, I pitched it to a couple of folks and it, it, um, it finally landed with the Atlantic magazine. Uh, I wanted to take portraits of Roy Moore supporters mm-hmm. and what I wanted to do that was show them as human. Right. And it's not being, you know, whatever folks had, had thought, you know, I try to not look at where we're different and looking where we're the same. And I know that sounds really cliche, but that's, that's where I go mm-hmm. is, you know, this person who's on the other side of this issue or whatever, or, you know, thinks totally different than me has the same values I have pretty much, right? They may have different opinions on certain things, but they, it's not like they want the country to explode or they want, you know, war or like crazy things. Most folks want the same things and it's just a different way of doing it. Yeah. And that's where I come to on that. And so that's where I try to, that's what I try to focus on. Yeah, I think that's a really smart approach to photography, to life. Um, I always feel that there's just gray area and it's really hard to box mm-hmm. people into something left or right or, you know, good or bad. It's, there's so much nuance in between that it's, it's yeah, difficult. And um, I will say that, um, you know, for example, Trump rallies can get a bit raucous, right? Yeah. And it, you know, of course there's people who are angry and screaming and it's happened to me where they've screamed at the media and called us names and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But by and large, like I haven't had a bad experience. This is back in 2016. I haven't been to any lately, but it's the same thing. Yeah. I didn't have any bad experiences. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, 
there was a, I think what happens is you see the same images over and over again of people like, ah, screaming. And then you are like, oh my God, like that's, that's crazy. And it's like, no, those are the, just the kinds of images that, that sell. Those are the kinds of images that get reaction. And so they get pushed to the top, uh -huh. you know, and I've shot those images, you know, and that's what, you know, that's, that's where the story ends up. But you're right, it's somewhere in between, right? It's in that gray. Have there um, been any um, situations you've been in that you've photographed that have impacted you on a personal level? Because you've been, it sounds like, so many places and like so many different environments um, that I'm sure draw emotion or, you know, elation or whatever it is. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. what, what has impacted you personally? So, I know I keep coming to these kind of like heavy themes, but I did a story for the Washington Post 2018 mm -hmm. about a former KKK member and a Muslim who became friends. Mm -hmm. And on the surface, I was like, oh my God, like, I don't know about this, right? I mean, <laughs> it seems like, it seems like too good to be true or kind of like made for TV special, you yeah. know, like, yeah, sure, that sounds great. but. So this guy named Chris Buckley is a former KKK member. He lives up in Lafayette, Georgia. And then uh, Haval Kelly, who's a Kurdish refugee, who's been, you know, lives in Clarkston, Georgia. He's been here since he was, you know, a kid. Mm -hmm. And he's a doctor now at Emory. Wow. So he, you know, the, the, these two guys, I don't know how, you know, Chris up in Lafayette left the KKK and was, you know, this guy kind of like saved him from the KKK, if that makes sense. And mm -hmm. Uh, the, and then uh, Chris and have all met online and they developed a friendship. And so the Washington Post, I, I went for the Washington Post with a reporter and, and then I spent some time with, with both of these guys on, on, you know, on my own. Um, and it was, it was real, mm -hmm. you know, it was, again, you know, it's reminded me that whatever, I mean, of course, Chris had, had, had renounced, you know, his past life and was trying to make amends basically mm -hmm. for, for the kind of life he had lived. Yeah. And so it just reminded me that people can change and that no matter what there, there, there is good, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it really, cause I mean, it, it's so easy to get, you know, dragged down in negative, in negativity online with stories and, yeah news and just what's happening and it's like yep see everything's crazy yep see it's it's all going to hell in a handbasket you know it's so easy it's almost impossible to not feel that way right? right yeah you know unless you just turn it off and so this was like despite the the heaviness of you know chris being a former clan member it's like holy crap like that's woof. you know but it, it was it was a great story you know and chris um is is changed his life and, and is, is doing great you know uh, he actually came to a Braves game and brought his kid uh, -huh. uh and uh you know I said hello to him and he you know it, it was great to see him you know and he's he's yeah. trying his best you know and so anyway it's just a uh that was a story that really really impacted me on a personal level mm -hmm. to know that it's not all bad yeah know? yeah I think that would be effective for anybody involved and to get to know those people um I think yeah, and that story got picked up again and again and again. Like it, it got a lot of a lot of traction. Uh, again, I think because it was real and not uh, not fabricated or, right. or surface. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think any of the examples of those extreme examples of forgiveness and you know, you're. I know yes. for me, like sometimes I'm thinking to myself, like, could I do that? You know, could I forgive yeah. that? You know when things are done that you can't, you know, fathom and you're like, would I be able to reach that? Yeah. Level? That's really, would you be able to forgive someone who lived that life? Right. And yeah. yeah, it was, it was a lot, you know, it was a lot to take in and, and, um, and, and, and if you, if you have time, check it out online. Uh, I, you know, the story was well written. Um, it was, it was done with a lot of care. And, you know, it wasn't trying to make Chris a saint because he's not a saint, right. you know, it's, and that's, that's the reality of it. You know, it's not trying to say that, you know, this guy's a, a perfect, you know, by no stretch. Mm -hmm. And he would tell you that, but it's, yeah. you know, so anyway, that was, that was one in particular that, that impacted me on a, on a deep level. Yeah, I can, I can understand why. Definitely. Uh, yeah. I know what impacts you now. I'm an example of it. <laughs> so now I'm wondering what inspires you overall. 
Oh, let me know. Gosh, you know, that's such a, that was the hardest question you said, I think. Um, you know, I find inspiration in, in so many places, you know, music, you know, art, photography, obviously. Um, but I try to think about what, um, what's meaningful to people in a broad sense. For example, like when I did that Highway 83 story, um, I got a lot of, I got more feedback from that than just about anything. Yeah. Uh, maybe the, maybe that story I just talked about. Okay. Um, but, but those are two totally different reasons, but the, the Highway 83 story I was talking about earlier, um, it was so meaningful to people because, you know, it had, it talked about, or it, I think it, it explored what it, what like home means, what, um, uh, you know, like coming, cause it was called the road back home, you know, cause it was, I was always going back home, you know, and what that means, you know, as you drift, you know, in life, when you, you know, end up in different paths, but you always come back home. Yeah. So I think about stuff like that, what, you know, how to illustrate these kinds of things, like with that story, you know, and with the Bostwick story, you know, sense of place, uh, what's it like to come back home? That's, that's another one. Um, but, you know, and again, like, I know I'm talking about the same things, but again, like that newsroom story about, about work and community, what that means, like, it was, I didn't realize how meaningful it was to be around people every day. Uh, and, and just have little, little conversations about like, Hey, how's your daughter? You know, how's, how's this, how's that? You know, cause in the freelance world, you know, this is, this is my office, mm -hmm. right? This is, you know, when I'm not shooting, this is where I'm, you know, editing and you know, whatever. Right. So, and it's not that, I mean, you know, the Braves is a little different cause I do see the same people just mm -hmm. about every day, but you know, that, that sense of place, mm -hmm. you know, you have as an, in an office that, that, that I think is so important. So that's where that, that inspiration for that came from just thinking about like, why is that important? You know, and I, and when I th think about that, it's like, well, how can I illustrate that? You know, so these are where inspiration, that's an example of where inspiration comes from me is just trying to illustrate something that means something to me yeah. and that I think would mean something to someone else, you know? Do you think um, like long on, if an idea comes to you, are you like processing it in your brain or do you, prefer to just kind of experiment and see how things go. Like you keep shooting when you have the room to do something like that. So sometimes an idea will marinate for like years, mm -hmm. you know, it'll come up and you're like, Oh, that's a good idea. And then you try to work it in, uh, to different, um, different assignments, you know, like another one I've been, I've been working on, um, haven't published anything on it yet, but, uh, again, this is religion and sports, mm -hmm. uh, a tenor, like something I would call like for example worship because I feel like what people do at sporting events resembles worship in a lot of ways right. right and so finding those kinds of themes particularly religious themes within sports you know something that I've been trying to do but so there's an example of like something that kind of bounced into my head a few years ago it's like oh why don't you try to shoot that while you're at a sporting event mm -hmm. right um, but yeah, ideas can come from different places and they, sometimes they marinate for a long time right. until the right time comes along. You're like, Oh, that's it. Now we can do that. You know, uh, other times it, it, it's more instant, you know? Um, so I, the biggest struggle though, I tell you what, for me is finding time for personal work is yeah. when there's so many assignments, you got to make a living, mm -hmm. you know, you got to pay the mortgage, you got to do this. Uh, and you know, it, it's, to find that space and balance it and carve out the time for yourself to do it is, is perhaps one of the hardest things mm -hmm. um, in being a freelancer without being swallowed up by the work. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You know? You've got deadlines and priorities. And so I'm sure those little moments you get, you hold on tight to them when you can. Yeah. And then the other thing is that when I'm not working mm -hmm. shooting, then it's sometimes hard to shoot for myself mm -hmm. on my off time. Yeah. Cause it's like, man, I don't want to pick up a camera right now. Mm -hmm. yep. And what I found the way to do that is to pick up a different camera. I know that doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. but my work cameras, because I use them so much, mm -hmm. have a certain feeling to them. Right. When I pick it up, it feels like work. Uh -huh. Right. In a good, you know, I'm not saying in a bad way. I mean, it's a good way, but it does, it's work, right? 
Yeah. It's like picking up a shovel and knowing you're going to go dig a hole, right? It's like, I know I'm going to go work, you know? And that's, and I don't mean that to sound bad, but like, well, off time, I'm going to use a film camera. Yeah. Or another, another digital camera or yeah. something different because it has a different feeling and connotation to it than like work. Yeah, I think that totally makes sense. I can parallel it with the work I do. It's digital marketing, digital content management. And so if I'm writing with the angle of, you know, I'm trying to market a specific, specific service or whatever it is versus like creatively writing and just maybe telling a story or writing a poem or something like that. So it's still, yeah. still the act of writing, but it's just my brain is working in a different way. and so, yeah. yeah, I think that's important to to find a different wavelength to do that on and not, yeah. That, that's that's been a difficult thing but I mean finding ways to stay fresh and creative I think is 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 the struggle mm -hmm. yeah that nobody is you know excluded from yeah. sure yeah when you when you when you have your passion and you figure out how to make a living with it then it becomes work right right you know, it's, and then so it's like okay well how can I still keep this creative passion going and right. still work exactly. you know that, that's you know that's not a new struggle at all I mean yeah uh, yeah, you know, the first, when you first come up and you're like, oh, wow, this is easy. It's, you know, it's no big deal. It's just, you know, fun. And it's like, well, you know, after a few years, it's like, okay, I got to keep this somewhat fun and not be, you know, dragged down by it all, you know? Exactly. Yeah. I think everything you said made sense. I can relate. To <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, well, good deal. Yeah, well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I want to say thanks again for agreeing to chat with me. This has been an amazing conversation. I'm like learning and excited at, you know, the thought. And I love that I'm a very visual person. So it's like you're referencing these moments in time where I'm like, well, there are pictures. <laughs> so I can like go and actually yeah. see the pictures, read the stories and refer to it. So I'm going to definitely link through to your website and um, your Instagram also so people can see your work. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a great, um, great interview. I've, I've had a, a good time. Um, I like what you're doing. I love your passion, your energy. Um, you know, you were persistent. You know, you came to me a couple of times and, and I'm sorry I was a little bit slowing it back to you. But. <laughs> <You're fine. laughs> and thanks for coming out to photo night. That's yeah. been really. I'll um, plug that real quick. I forgot to like tell people what you do. Oh, sure. Sure. So uh, myself and a friend of mine, Ray Jones, another independent photographer here in Atlanta, put together uh, an event every month except for December. We take December off because everyone's so busy. Uh, but it's an artist talk. So we have a photographer come and show work. Um, we have had people who are not photographers. Well, we had a guy come and talk who's the, um, who is a life coach. Right? He's a former photographer, but now he's a life coach. That you know that was pertinent. At any rate, we come and show work and we talk about the creative process. That's that's where we we try to stay on. You know, it's not about cameras and lenses and things. Although that does get discussed, the, the, the crux of it is about the creative process, talk about, you know, what, how you approach subject matters. There's a lot of stuff we talked about today, you know, how do you, you know, like portrait photographers, how do you, how do you get people to do what you want, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's a great event. It, you know, we, we average between 75 and hundred people every month. Uh, so yeah, check us out, atlphotonight.com. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good time. It's free. Yeah. yeah. It's a uh, networking event too. I mean, networking sounds so like corporate and commercial, right. like, oh, come network, you know, but I mean, it's a real thing. Yeah. But you're amongst creatives. I've loved it. Like the times I've gone and attended, like I always learn something new um, and I just enjoy the talks because um, in many ways, I think it's what I'm trying to achieve here is just bringing out the human element in things like photography. Mm -hmm. And so having somebody sit down and talk about their method, how they got started and what me, like what life means to them in general, I think it's uh, always awesome and always interesting to see. So I love what you guys are doing. Well, this whole interview is like photo day, like <laughs> what we've talked about. I mean, in, in a way, I mean, I mean, this is, this is, precisely what we do is talk yeah. about how do you create what means what, what does it mean to you mm -hmm. you know what inspires you uh so hats off to you this is um, <laughs> thank you yeah this is this is great yeah this has been a lot of fun um so once again thank you so much kevin for um sitting down to chat with me 
Uh, to anyone viewing, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, give it a like. Like, And if you want to see more content like this where I'm interviewing um, smart, creative people about their process um, and how it relates to communication, then you can subscribe to my channel. Um, I will include links in the description area for um, the blog I'll be writing about Kevin and his information, like his Instagram and his um, website. Thank you so much. Thank you. Had a good time. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. I'll say bye, Kevin. <laughs> See you guys.